this is a video response to that woman whose name I don't know how to pronounce. Laura, 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 Anyway, she's British and she does art in psychology and stuff. So she did a video response to uh, Bike Messenger about forgiveness. And so this is a video response to her. Because when I hear the word forgiveness, I bristle. My back goes up. Because I was raised in one of those fundamentalist, Bible-thumping, evangelical churches. A mega church. So to me, although I never articulated it until I started thinking about this right before I made this video. To me, forgiveness meant, means, insinuates, implies... I'm better than you. You don't deserve me. You're a screw-up. You're a failure. But I'm going to tolerate you anyway because I love you so much. So forgiveness is one of those words that hasn't been in my active vocabulary in a very long time. So Earl did this thing about forgiveness and then Lord Alehi who did it to... And I'm like, well, what the hell does forgiveness mean? It's one of those words that people just assume they know what it means, you know. So I looked it up. And the Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online said that it's an acknowledgement that human beings are imperfect and make mistakes. The God I grew up with acknowledged that human beings were weak and made mistakes. Not in, that was it, weak made mistakes. He acknowledged it, but he wouldn't tolerate it. And then I started thinking about that stuff about resentment and distrust. The last time I got very badly betrayed, and it is a feeling of grief. It's, a, it's like the stages of grief because it's such a loss of, of something that was part of my reality. It was my ex and I had gotten to a point where we could not be fully human with each other. I hesitate to say this because this is YouTube, but I, and who knows who will pick this up. But she was uncharacteristically, but she was very physically violent with me. She beat me in the head. She's a lot taller and stronger than I am. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. She's a trans woman. She's a lot stronger than I am. And she's trained in martial arts, so she ought to have more self-discipline. But she beat me repeatedly in the head. I was backed in a corner and could not leave. And you know, I have brain injuries, and I also have bad teeth. And it really messed me up. My ears were funny for months afterwards. If I was holding a telephone receiver, the phone would ring, and the, brrr, the trilling sound would vibrate through my head and my eyes would vibrate. I, everything was like buzzing. And I broke into abscesses in my mouth from my bad teeth. She also left just not too long after that. So I was so focused on survival. Uh, I still, I was stuck with a year's lease on an apartment and now I had to pay for the whole thing myself. My income was almost $700 and the rent was 650 so I had to take in these god-awful roommates. <sighs> you know, I was trying to cope with the fact that my head wasn't working right. My ears, my eyes, my mouth. And God knows what was going on with my brain. And then I had to move, like, almost all the way across the state. And that turned out to be a nightmare and a disaster. The woman lured me there under false pretenses and... So I haven't had a safe or stable place to live since before my ex and I went sour. And that's been seven or eight years. So I haven't really had much time to worry about forgiveness. I also haven't had any um, strong human contact since then. Because my living situation has been so bad and I've had to move so many times just to try to stay alive that I haven't been able to form attachments. Or I've lived in communities where I've had to be so closeted about being an atheist or being a queer or being a feminist or being a progressive or just voting for Obama, which is obviously a mistake, but still, I couldn't tell anybody I voted for Obama. 
the communities were that reactionary. So dealing with people and being disappointed by them doesn't happen very often with me. And then recently this thing happened. I had learned this from my mother, but I have not hung around people that were as unhealthy as my mother for a very long time. So this situation took me by surprise because it's been so long since I've experienced something like this. All I needed was for the situation to level out and calm down so that I could stabilize and not become triggered or frightened or disoriented and to not be put in a position where my lack of visual acuity was causing so much um, anxiety. And instead of hearing that, this person interpreted me as a liar and as some sort of a leech, like a parasite. I was just so surprised. And when I tried to say, that's not me, that's, you're not talking to me, uh, the person became very vicious and said some things that were intentionally as cold-bloodedly sadistic as possible. And I was just stunned because whoever this person was talking to, it wasn't me, but the person took information about me and weaponized it, turned it against me. Things that I can't change. My, I can't change my brain injury and my PTSD. And I thought, well, how am I going to deal with this? Because I really care about this person. I'm really invested in this relationship. And I looked at the person's life and I looked at mine. And I'm not saying this person is doing things worse or better than I am because we're all just stumbling through this mess. I also don't do popular media, so I'm, I'm not to attune to the politics and mind games of human interactions anymore. But what I saw was, and I was reminded of this just recently by another thing, it was a film, uh, 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 and the character was basically putting up hoops for the other person to jump through. The other person was supposed to prove their loyalty and love by basically putting up with a bunch of crap. Uh, uh, if you really love me, you'll let me do this to you. Um, you have to prove you love me. And I was astounded at how so much I don't want to do that. It's so, it just doesn't seem very authentic. It also seems completely unnecessary because the evidence for my loyalty and my trustworthiness is all right there. If you want to demonize somebody, you're going to do that, right? And that's what I think this person was doing to me. And I don't take it personally. I don't know why this person feels it's necessary to go there. All of us are weak and all of us make mistakes. And that's how I've had to frame this. So if that's what forgiveness is, really, if that's what forgiveness is, then I'm okay with that. But I still don't really include it in my vocabulary very much. Jackass next door, Ray, I know he's mentally ill. Um, and I respect that and I appreciate that. But I can't respect or appreciate his self-indulgence around that. That's not a symptom of mental illness. That's ego. That was the other thing I wanted to say. It's about ego. Uh, the resentment and stuff, because I know about resentment. Uh, I resented my mother for her mental illness for decades, for most of my adult life. And, and her psychosis and her, God, she was sadistic. It's why I have brain injury and mutilated genitals and post-traumatic stress. And I'm not going to forgive her because she was sick. She was sick. But she was closeted about it. She was in total denial. There's that much stigma on mental health. Now, Ray, at least he knows he's mentally ill, but he uses it as a tool to manipulate people. I'm sick, so I don't have to be responsible. Yes, you do. 
Oh, yes, you do. In fact, you have to be more responsible when you have behavioral health challenges because the stigma is so great. And people are always going to be looking out, in my case, people are always looking out for symptoms. Aha, she did that because she's crazy. Which was part of the dynamic between me and this person recently. Throwing up my behavioral health challenges in my face. But in a twisted and warped form that has nothing to do with me. That says, I'm not listening to you. I'm just going to tell you what's wrong with you and read your beads. And tell you how inadequate you are and how much you need help. Okay. Uh, who are you talking to? Because this has nothing to do with me. So there's this ego component to resentment and stuff about, and maybe my isolation has helped me a lot in that because I can't afford to have a real strong ego defense mechanism thing. I have to deal with survival. I can't wallow in self-pity. I can't be self-indulgent. I can't get drunk. You know, I can't just, oh, boo-hoo and open a bottle because what if, like, there was an emergency like what if the trailer caught fire or what if Ray went psychotic and I had to run out of here and call the cops and the cops showed up and I had alcohol on my breath or what if because I'd been drinking I fell asleep and let it lift the cigarette lit or the stove on because I have a bad memory or what if I didn't maintain control over my emotions because alcohol does things with inhibitions and stuff and then there's also who needs more dead brain cells i've got enough already um so i can't afford to indulge myself i really can not to mention i can't afford the alcohol i used to drink a lot this is why i'm mentioning alcohol i used to drink a lot when i was middle class to cope to manage to stay in my seat at work uh to not feel anything now it's better to just go ahead and feel it, process it, work through it, uh, just face it and get it over with. This is very rambly. Um, but if forgiveness means acknowledging that other human beings are weak and make mistakes, then it seems to me that that fact, the weakness and the making mistakes, needs to be taken into consideration at the same point at which one decides whether or not one chooses to trust. And it would seem to me that trust needs to be incremental. Give people little tasks, see if they can accomplish them. If they can, then you can entrust them with more and more responsibility involved in your life. Uh, that's interdependence, not codependence. Attaching one's ego to what? other people do to other people's behaviors attitudes um, psychological constructs that's bound to fail which is probably why I'm not married I have to keep limits because if I go past my limits I don't stretch I snap if I see myself ever get to a point where I'm so stressed out that I might have a psychotic break I will, well, hopefully I can prevent it from getting to that point. But there have been some occasions where people have really screwed me over and it was a big surprise and I couldn't prepare for it. But if I ever get into a situation like that again, I will make arrangements for my animals so that I can't take it out on them. Because there's nobody whose shoulder I can cry on or that I can call up in, in the middle of the night and expect some tea and sympathy or anything like that. You know, there's nobody to hug me. Oh, there's nobody to even get in an argument with close by, you know. And it's taken a lot of years of coping to learn the strategies of living in this enforced solitary confinement i you know i do the best i can to interact with people i really do but i have to be so self-protective because if people find out who i am they get vicious that happened last summer and and those people nearly killed me they came after me with a gun so forgiveness if it means people are weak and if it means people make mistakes that i can wrap my head around 
I can't afford to be pessimistic. If I become pessimistic, I become suicidal. I have to be optimistic. I have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I have to really be prepared on a real fundamental level because I'm living on a knife edge. But I also have to be hopeful for the best in people. And you know what? If I approach people that way and I let them know the good things about themselves and stuff, God, most of the time they're so responsive and they're so grateful to hear it. And they're so glad to be seen. They're just like so happy to be seen, uh, you know, and appreciated and respected. So it's feedback loop. I get positive stuff from telling people positive stuff. And I trained myself to see positive stuff so I wouldn't focus on the negative stuff and make myself sick. I know my mother was human and I know she made mistakes. And I know she, on several occasions she damn near murdered a child. She terrified me. And she really badly damaged me. I know she's human and I know she made mistakes. And I know that if I ever see a mother or any adult treat a child the way my, or any other adult, the way my mother treated me, I'd do whatever was in my power to make it stop. Because a child can't consent to something like that. And non-consensual cruelty is, is not acceptable.